Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, the, an event organized by the Middle East Program at the Wilson Center and co-hosted by USIP on the future of violent extremism in the Middle East. Um, we are very fortunate to have excellent panelists today, um, in, starting with Ambassador James Jeffrey, who is the chair of the Middle East Program, former ambassador to Iraq and Turkey, and to the special and special envoy to the Global Coalition to defeat ISIS. Um, again, with us, who um, our distinguished fellow uh, that we share with USIP, um, Robin Wright, um, who's very well known in Washington policy circles and just returned from a trip um, uh, in the Middle East. Um, and um, finally, at least last but not least, uh, Ali Soufan, who's the chairman and CEO of the Soufan Group. And with us today to moderate this discussion is Anne Bernard from the New York Times. And I'm gonna leave this to you to um, navigate this conversation moving forward. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have a, an interesting discussion for today. Um, I just would like to start by noting that it has been two years, it will be exactly two years tomorrow since uh, the defeat uh, or at least the uh, physical collapse of the caliphate uh, created by the Islamic State. About two years ago, we were, uh, my colleagues from the New York Times and, and others were um, reporting on the last holdouts in Northeastern Syria, fighting for survival of the caliphate, which now there is no longer territory held by Islamic State, but the group still exists and, and remains a, a challenge for the region and internationally. It's also this month and, and in these uh, last few months, we've been looking at the region through the lens of the 10 years since the Arab uprisings began in Tunisia, Libya, Syria, and beyond. And of course, the, the, the most uh, persistent chaotic outcome has been in Syria and the uh, bleeding of the ISIS threat into Iraq. And sort of uh, that's what really brought the, the issue to the global public in a different way, perhaps uh, with, with more urgency than the underlying causes of the problem, which were the, the lack of meaningful citizenship in the region and poor governance and repression. So of course, these are issues that actually do go hand in hand um, and none of these issues have fully been resolved. So, so I'm glad we have our speakers here today to, to talk about where we stand now. Um, of course, uh, there are more than a dozen franchises of ISIS existing from West Africa to East Asia. Uh, there, uh, it, ISIS can still be an engine for radicalization of, of people anywhere. Of course, we're also dealing with other forms of radicalization around the world um, in, in a time of disinformation and uh, growing authoritarianism. So we're seeing uh, right-wing uh, groups evolving, sometimes using uh, similar uh, methods as ISIS spreading radicalization online and relying on actors with varying degrees of connection to the organization to act on their ideology. So this is really a, a global issue. Um, and I, I think we'll have an interesting discussion here. First, I'll ask an introductory question to each of the panelists. And then the panelists uh, will discuss with each other for some time and I'll moderate that discussion. And then we'll turn to the audience. And we have a big audience today. And I want to remind you that at any time you can submit a question by email to MEP at wilsoncenter.org or you can tweet at Wilson Center MEP. So we're looking forward to your questions as well. Why don't we begin uh, with Robin Wright? Um, she has been a reporter covering the Middle East and North Africa and, and other areas for, for a long time and has just come back from a really interesting trip around the region uh, with the head of CENTCOM. So uh, I think we should start with you, Robin, to briefly describe your travels. What, what were you having access to? What were you seeing? And could you address this question for each of the places that you visited? 
briefly, and then we'll, we'll, we'll pick up these themes as we go along. What did you see as the biggest emerging challenge to local and international efforts to keep extremist militant groups in check? Did you see any overarching pattern that speaks to how the international community should assess and address violent extremism? That's a good question, Anne, and thank you for having me on this panel. I'm delighted uh, to be part of it and, and particularly honored to be on a panel with uh, Jim Jeffrey and Ali Sofa, whom I've admired for a long time. So my trip took me to Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And I think there are good, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that in each of these places, the US partners have been able to strengthen their hand militarily in confronting, taking down and identifying ISIS. The bad news is that almost everywhere, the political goals seem ever more elusive. I'll start a little further afield with Afghanistan because the president of the United States faces a very tough decision as of May 1st, which is the deadline for the withdrawal of all US forces after 20 years of a war against jihadi extremists. As everyone knows, there was a peace deal done between the Trump administration and the Taliban last year, but there is still no peace deal between the, the local players, between the Taliban and the Afghan government. Only six weeks remains. And while the Taliban has been scrupulous about not attacking American troops during that period, the fighting has gotten much nastier against Afghans, both the government and civilians. There are dozens of people dying every day. Americans tend not to notice because Americans are not among those who are being killed. But there is the expectation that if there's not a peace agreement and not a political agreement, by March, oh, sorry, by May 1st, that allows the United States to leave, that the deal with uh, between the US and the Taliban is off, the fighting will intensify and May 2nd could be very bloody. So the future of our counterterrorism effort, a uh, 20 year long program in which we've invested somewhere close to $2 trillion is really quite precarious. And, uh, it all depends on the politics. The military future depends on politics. So let me go to Syria because it's a similar picture. Exactly two years ago this month, I was in the Green Village, which was the front operational headquarters of the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, which the United States had been supporting, particularly with air power, but also advising it on the ground. Uh, the good news is the SDF is more professional. Uh, it has managed to uh, keep control of the territory despite challenges, both with, in terms of the, the regional politics within its territory in Northeast Syria, but also encroachments by the Russians, uh, the Iranians, the Syrians, and ISIS. Um, the bad news is that there, there is no political solution and the SDF and the American presence will have to be there, will probably have to be there until there is, and that's a long haul. Sure, just to show you the contrast, I remember the constant boom, boom two years ago when the ISIS was, let, uh, was fighting with the SDF, American warplanes were flying over. On this trip, the American troops in the Green Village were bored. They told me about how every two, uh, twice a week, they let loose the howitzer, uh, the, their big guns that fire into the desert, not at a target, but just to let ISIS know that they're there. Uh, there have not been casualties of late, not any major challenges against American forces. Uh, and yet, and it is one of the most cost efficient military deployments the United States has anywhere. 900 troops to hold a large chunk of Syria from not only ISIS, but a lot of others. And our presence there is now as much political as it is military against ISIS. So to Iraq, um, ISIS is still active. It still has large cells. There's some estimates that say that there are up to 10,000 different 
uh, ISIS fighters spread across both Iraq and Syria. Uh, the US tells me it's probably less, but they actually don't have a grip on, on what the number is. Uh, the, the, the good news is that the United States has strengthened Iraq's counterterrorism presence. It's done very well in creating a unit that can help uh, defend the country. The problem is the rest of the Iraqi army, which is not up to that par. And of course, uh, ISIS has some as of, uh, and most of all, because the, the government is seen to have a sectarian bias. Uh, a senior US official told me that the biggest danger in Iraq today is not ISIS. It's the popular mobilization forces that were cultivated by Iran are now part of the Iraqi security system, are predominantly Shiite and have their own agenda. They're not always controllable and they are in areas, they have moved into uh, areas that were traditionally Sunni again in the name of fighting ISIS, but this has taken on or produced sectarian tensions. So the problem in Iraq, once again, is political, finding a solution to some of the core problems that have prevailed since the US intervention in 2003. There is no massive reform program for sharing power. There's no agreement on the distribution of revenues of oil. And so this has then laid the groundwork for tensions that play out among militias, including ISIS. Now, last but not least, I went to Lebanon where I lived for five years during the rise of Hezbollah. Uh, I went out to the Beqa Valley, I went to Beirut, and I went up to just uh, around Tripoli. I looked at what how the Lebanese army is doing. The Lebanese army is the one institution that is functioning in this country that is almost a failed state. It hasn't had a government since October. The warlords are no longer fighting each other militarily. They're fighting each other politically. And the danger is that the warlords will fight each other until to the point that Lebanon becomes a failed state. So the Lebanese army is really critical. ISIS has tried once again to take advantage of that vacuum and it has started to resurge after being pushed out of the Eastern mountains on the Syrian border. Uh, two sleeper cells have been captured this year. Um, they think there are others. Again, a lot of it's exploratory, capitalizing on uh, the vacuum, the political vacuum in the country. So I guess the bottom line, when you look at all four of these places is that there is hope that the US investment has helped strengthen local forces. ISIS or, or the various militias have not disappeared because of political problems. And this is something that I think is gonna plague the United States over and over and over. And it goes back to what Anne mentioned, and that is the Arab Spring. We know that the Arab population today, the 21st century, predominantly young, the majority are young and the majority of voters are increasingly accounting for, uh, are increasingly from the young, want a different political environment. They want more participation, more freedoms, uh, less harassment, less sectarianism. And the problem is how to get there. It's the ancien regime in some places, broken systems, uh, longstanding tensions that have prevented the kind of solutions. And as a result, all whether it's ISIS or Al Qaeda or uh, the, you know, Hezbollah, that all of these forces will remain a major problem with the potential to hit us, whether in the region or down the road, um, if we can't help solve some of these political problems. And while we're happy to make war to, to fight these people, the one thing the United States has not been good at is helping make the peace. And I'll stop there. So what I'm hearing you say, Robin, is that certainly across um, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq, which I've also, you know, covered uh, recently for many, many years. Uh, what we're seeing is that the uh, that the underlying political problems are not solved, and in some cases have even been made worse uh, during during the 
the global fight against ISIS. Afghanistan also has, uh, you know, thorny political issues that, that despite 20 years of war have, have really not been solved. Slightly different model in Afghanistan, but in those uh, three countries in the Levant, we're talking about, uh, in Iraq, we're talking about um, even uh, contradiction, political contradictions in the global fight against ISIS in that in Lebanon and, and in Iraq, and also in Syria, especially in the parts where the U.S. is not involved, the, the, the you know, people fighting against ISIS have been uh, from, from groups backed by Iran that are, for some of the population, really exacerbating problems. Um, and, and in some countries, the U.S. allies with those groups, in others it doesn't, and it's all very confusing and later we'll get into to the confused alliances with Turkey and the Syrian Kurds. Um, in any case, I think um, this leads us really, really nicely into um, Ali, our next uh, guest, and uh, welcome. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you, you know, let's, let's pan out a little bit. There is a debate in the foreign policy community about whether the, the top big picture priority going forward should be these counterterrorism efforts uh, or great power competition. So could you maybe talk to us about how these two arenas are related at this time in history, particularly? Can you do one without the other? And, and it, you know, which one should be the priority? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for um, having me uh, with you today. Uh, it's a great honor to be with you and Ambassador Jeffrey and Robin, a great fan. Um, you know, after almost uh, 20 years uh, of fighting the um, uh, global war on terror, we can start to see fatigue appears, you know, uh, appearing in, in Washington, uh, especially on the counterterrorism front. Uh, the Biden administration's recent uh, national security strategic guidance de prioritize uh, United States counterterrorism efforts uh, in favor to more of a geopolitical focus and interstate competition, especially competition among the great powers or near power. Um, uh, the pendulum appears to have swung back towards nation states. Uh, the, the threat um, you know, of uh, geopolitics uh, that we see, that uh, we see in the Middle East and other areas, especially with countries such as Iran, such as uh, Turkey, North Korea, Russia, um, all this creates an, an idea in Washington that we need to focus more on great power competition or near power competition, especially with countries like Russia and China. However, uh, as you mentioned, and this is not an either or scenario, uh, the United States must be able to conduct counterterrorism operations in order to address the threats from non-state actors. In the same time, we need to compete uh, with our primary nation state adversaries. Uh, the threat posed by terrorist groups, by violent extremists, non-state actors, are not always mutually exclusive from those posed by states. Um, you know, a lot of these states are manipulating uh, such groups, uh, creating regional allies out of them and creating proxies out of them uh, to, uh, Enlarge to, to, to kind of like reach their own strategic aims and goals. Uh, over the past two decades, uh, the United States has invested massive amount of manpower, energy. Uh, we invested massive amount of financial resources to develop a comprehensive worldwide counterterrorism infrastructure. Uh, this includes tactical and operational innovations. We have world class intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. Um, also, and more importantly, we created enduring security cooperation and partnerships and friendships with nations around the world, all the way from the Sahel to Southeast Asia. Uh, the U.S. also uh, spearheaded a number of efforts in the international sphere, efforts including un an unprecedented and sweeping uh, international legal framework through the United Nations Security Council. And we also spearheaded the establishment of the Global Counterterrorism Forum. So there is great risk in letting these capab capabilities uh, degenerate. Uh, we need to be able to, um, uh, to, to use these capabilities uh, in uh, any kind of strategy that focus on great power competition. 
Russia and Iran in particular uh, lie at the scene of counterterrorism and great power competition. Both are increasingly utilizing uh, non-state actors to achieve their strategic objectives. Russia, for example, you can see the separatists in Ukraine with Iran, you, see, you can see the Houthis in Yemen are all both, uh, you know, um, you know, well-trained um, and they are backed by um, these states, uh, you know, Russia and Iran, they are equipped with high-tech weaponry, including uh, sophisticated missiles, as we've seen the Saudi, the, the, the Houthis using such uh, missiles to attack Riyadh. Um, and as we have seen in Libya, we've seen in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, even in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, not only Russia and Iran here, but also Turkey and other powers in the region have enjoyed varying degrees of successes through the use of private military companies, uh, private fighters, uh, sectarianism, uh, and uh, you know, is becoming a new uh, geopolitical currency in the Middle East. It's actually, I don't know how new it is, but it's a geopolitical, very valuable geopolitical currency in the uh, Middle East. And thus we have sectarian and ethnic militias working uh, most of the time on behalf of these regional and international powers. So working through these actors uh, has become the preferred means of uh, operating in many cases uh, for regional powers. And uh, they are using them while seeking to avoid direct escalation, but they um, try to impose uh, their own uh, you know, policies through them. Um, so uh, there is a trend that is going, uh, you know, we, we, I, I fear that we're going to see this trend uh, more and more in the future. Uh, so the Biden administration here must ensure that counterterrorism tools and strategies remain an integral part of the comprehensive approach uh, to United States national security uh, and cannot be wholly divorced from the great or near power competition. Uh, you heard uh, a brilliant summary from Robin after her recent visit to the Middle East. Uh, you heard Robin talking about Lebanon, talking about Iraq, talking about Afghanistan. Each one of these countries that she mentioned have regional and international players. Each one have groups and militias and non-state actors acting on behalf of these international and regional power. So um, I hope this administration will figure out how to uh, sharpen our abilities uh, to walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah, and, and we should add, of course, the United States is among uh, the, the powers that are that are using non-state actors as, as proxies. I mean, this is yeah. this is exactly the model of great power competition right now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so let's go to uh, Ambassador Jeffrey. Um, you've been involved in, in uh, all of these models, state building attempts, uh, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, uh, you know, whatever the flavor of the month was uh, during the, the past 20 years. Um, you have been in Iraq during the height of the insurgency and the civil war. I remember being at the embassy in Baghdad in uh, maybe 2005, uh, at a July 4th party uh, <laughs> talking about uh, how things were going. And, and I think uh, uh, although things might have been challenging, I'm not sure uh, we would have pictured uh, that things would be this way uh, 15 years later. Um, uh, you, you've been uh, deeply involved in the, the effort uh, in Syria with the anti-ISIS coalition and around the region. So, you know, you've seen successes and failures throughout the the way I think um, from our discussion earlier, uh, we all talked about some of the failures of state building attempts. Um, how would you advise the Biden administration right now? What would be what should be their top priority goals in the real hotspots: Syria, Iraq, Libya, Lebanon, Afghanistan, and, and specifically in how they should manage relationships across the region? And how should they, uh, you know, try to foster the political uh, solutions that that we cannot make happen on the ground with state building as history has shown. Thank you, Ian. Good to be here with uh, Robin, uh, with Ali, and with Marissa. Uh, first of all, uh, let's remember, and the Biden administration will have to remember, that there are reasons why we focus on terrorism. 9-11 uh, in the United States, 2015 across Europe, 
uh, dramatic developments with states almost falling to ISIS in 2014, all are reasons why we can't ignore it. And Ali has also uh, correctly noted as well that uh, our great power competitors, rather than seeing a black and white separation, will engage in this thing, ironically, either to take advantage of terrorism or to claim that they, if we're not gonna do the job, are the answer to terrorism. We see this a bit with the Russians in Syria. Uh, their main effort has been uh, barrel bombing uh, the opposition, but they do it under the guise of counterterrorism operations. So there are major reasons to engage. What we have learned is, however, that we have to be uh, humble in doing this. With really good luck, we not only can deal with the geostrategic manifestations of terrorism out of control, ISIS 2014-15, for example, Al-Qaeda in 2001, 2002, uh, but we can also, in very uh, successful cases, such as the campaign against ISIS, actually destroy the organization as a territorial force and push it back to a kind of sleeper cell insurgency, people scattered around the countryside, as Robin described it, in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, when we're not quite that successful, as in West Africa, uh, we again can avoid the worst, but really not do a whole lot against the basic infrastructure of the organization. And then in the worst case, uh, again, Afghanistan, we run into great troubles. So what are the lessons? First of all, as Ali said, by, with, and through local allies. Uh, conventional military forces, particularly in that part of the world, are not very effective against terrorists. What's effective against terrorists uh, or insurgencies generally are elite forces like the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service, uh, ideological forces like the leadership of the SDF, the YPG, uh, or ethnic forces such as the uh, Kurdish Peshmerga. Uh, these are all people who, for one or another reason, uh, have a real desire to fight and a culture that encourages them to actually fight like the terrorists, fight like the insurgents. Uh, secondly, uh, and this is very important, uh, we have to avoid thinking that we can fix the underlying problems. It is true that uh, the reason we have terrorism in this part of the world and don't have it usually in Scandinavia is the underlying social and economic conditions. We just don't know how to fix those underlying social and economic conditions. We have tried repeatedly in the Middle East in particular, but also in Central America and elsewhere, with a few limited exceptions, Colombia, for example, we've had very little success. Furthermore, this is where you get the dichotomy between great power competition and counterterrorism, uh, particularly with the limited number of forces even a powerful country like the United States has. If you engage in hundreds of thousands of troops as part of that effort to do, uh, I call it armed nation building, you will force the country to decide, do we do counterterrorism on a big scale or do we do great power competition? Thus, keep your hands off of uh, trying to fix the underlying problems. It would be nice if we could do so. It would be the ultimate answer. That answer is only in the hearts and minds of populations and their state governance and uh, we may have to wait a long time. The third thing is, however, diplomacy has to have the lead. Normally, when we say that in the State Department, it immediately defaults in our minds, in the minds of the White House, and frankly, in the minds of the Pentagon to nation building, and we're going to make these countries uh, uh, be different, look like uh, Denmark, and frankly, uh, reconcile uh, age-old differences. No, diplomacy for, again, a more modest but effective purpose. First of all, while you cannot change these countries, you can do something to ensure that communities where you've cleaned out ISIS can function. And we've done that, for example, in Northeast Syria uh, and with help of the UNDP and parts of Iraq. Secondly, political action to deal with the various actors to ensure that there are balances on the ground, for example, between the uh, Kurdish elements that are in the SDF who are aligned in various ways to the PKK and other Kurdish elements in Northeast Syria who are aligned with the Syrian opposition and particularly to the uh, Erbil 
uh, Iraqi Kurds. Those are the kind of things diplomacy can do. Finally, and this is very important because we keep on missing this point, diplomacy is critically important when we engage even with limited forces because we scramble the local geostrategic situation. We've seen this in Afghanistan, code word Pakistan. We've seen it in Northeast Syria, code word Turkey. Uh, diplomacy has to ensure that when we're doing X, typically counterterrorism, we don't simultaneously do Y, provoke a problem in the neighborhood that undercuts our whole terrorist uh, activity. Now that's easier said than done because the problem we have with terrorism is it's like trafficking in people. It's like hard drugs. We develop a moral position on this with us or not. And therefore, it's just so evident to us that everybody has to be at least, uh, if not with us in the fight against terrorist group A or B, at least sit on their hands and let us do the job. That's not true. Pakistan has many reasons to fear uh, Islamic violent extremists, but it has in its own mind, bigger reasons to fear India. And that's what shapes what it does and doesn't do in Afghanistan. Turkey has been hit by massive ISIS attacks, certainly more than any country or all countries in um, Europe, but yet uh, it sees a greater threat from the PKK and its Syrian offshoots than it does from ISIS. So it's gonna act accordingly. That's the role of diplomacy to ensure that whatever we're doing in the counterterrorism fight is not undercut by the reactions of the neighborhood to an American, an allied, or even a local partner military presence because the local partners will have agendas that may be different than us. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I'll follow up with a, a lightning round for our panelists who can then uh, hopefully respond to each other and talk among themselves. However, I first want to remind us uh, that there is a, a way to ask questions for the audience. Uh, I, I'd love to, to see questions from people who are from or in the regions we're talking about or uh, have uh, their own insights from there. So uh, you need to just uh, send an email to mep at wilsoncenter.org or tweet at Wilson Center MEP. Looking for your questions, thank you. Um, so, so let me just uh, push back a little on, on one thing that I think is missing from our conversation, which is uh, the people of, of these countries themselves. I mean, they have agency and to a remarkable degree in the past 10 years in the face of all kinds of violence and um, abandonment by the international community and uh, you know failed efforts to support them. They continue in all of these countries through civil society, through street protests, through youth activities um, to, to try to fight back simultaneously against uh, uh, extremist groups as well as against their own governments that are making their lives miserable, failing to protect them from all kinds of social ills as well as uh, to provide their security. I think, you know, when we look at Lebanon, there's been an amazing anti-sectarian uh, civil protest movement, the same in Iraq. Um, and and in Syria, of course, there was an incredibly brave civil protest movement that was crushed by sort of unbelievable violence. So the, the question is, uh, how can, if, if, if one thing our panelists all seem to agree on is that uh, traditional massive US led top down sort of paternalistic uh, state building efforts aren't gonna work and aren't cost effective and are distracting and, and probably you know actively counterproductive. So, is there a way that that the US and, and, and the international community can support, maybe simply supporting by not engaging in politics, uh, in, in policies that, that, um, that undermine uh, these efforts by, by locals, which have also included uh, you know, effective ideological and sometimes military uh, efforts against ISIS. Uh, so so is it a matter of, of uh, changing our, our diplomacy with 
uh, the, the, some of the authoritarian governments that we have to deal with in one way or another? Is, are there other things to be done? Or is it just something that has to be left to uh, internal developments? Uh, why don't uh, why don't we uh, start um, again uh, with Robin and 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 then you guys can go in the same order and then feel free to respond to each other uh, for the next uh, twenty minutes and I, I can interject if uh, if I'm inspired to but I may not need to. You know that sounds very appealing, uh, but the reality is that many of these groups have legitimate support and significant support on the ground. In Afghanistan, the Taliban is, you know, popular in some parts of the country. It has prevailed. The, the estimate is that the Taliban now controls about at least 50% of the country. The Taliban claims 70%. But the fact is they are there and wishing them away, whether with military force or political pressure, is, a, is an illusion. The same thing is true with Hezbollah in Lebanon. It is, you know, the second, it is, it is the power broker when it comes to parliament or even basic, basic security issues. And of course, in, in providing social services. We see these protests and you, Anne, you and I have been lucky enough to see them firsthand on the ground. We are inspired by how particularly the young are trying to create political alternatives. We saw it in the Arab Spring. We've seen it continue sporadically across the region, even in the midst of, of ISIS challenges in places like Iraq, um, even some in Syria. The, the problem is that this generation, the one that we all aspire to see grow because they are connected, because they understand their rights, because they understand change that's happened elsewhere in the world, they don't have the tools, the tactics, the coordination, the political maturity, the experience, or the parties that create viable alternatives. We are in a transition period across the Middle East and South Asia that we are going to continue to see these pockets of, of different kinds of political ph phenomena, whether it's the Taliban trying to take a country back to the ways of life in the seventh century, or Hez Hezbollah creating you know, um, a state within a state that is predominantly Shiite. That, that this is really one of the big questions we face worldwide. And the, the challenge is not just what can we do. Too often we think, as you put it, the military, or as Jim put it, the military nation building. The problem is when we do that to try to fight the, count, you know, the, the extremist movements, we find that once we get tired or bored or accomplish part of our agenda, then we pull out. And a lot of the time, the funding goes with it. And one of my favorite analogies is that very poignant scene from Charlie Wilson's War, which was a wonderful movie starring Tom Hanks that chronicles how a flamboyant Texas congressman and a rogue CIA agent managed to mobilize billions of support to train and advise the Mujahideen to fight the Soviet Union, and they ultimately prevailed. Once the Soviet Union withdrew in 1989, Charlie Wilson has to go back to Congress to ask for just a, a million dollars, a mere million dollars for education. And Congress just isn't interested. They rebuff him. They, and Wilson laments, that's what we always do. We go into these countries with our great ideals and, and then we leave. And the is often required to foster, whether it's a military, local military to fight extremism, a government to come up with compromises that will make it more representative, more inclusive, and guarantee wider rights. That's really hard. And the United States does not have a long attention span. And to me, having covered 9-11 and having lost people I new in the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. It is astounding to me that the vast majority of Americans indicate they are either uninterested or exhausted by Afghanistan, don't really want to hear about it, and when asked by pollsters, aren't even interested in answering questions about their feelings. So this is where we have this conundrum of how do we do what is right? And how do we create alternatives? And 
how do we sustain our involvement in a way that also will prove that the credit the United States is a credible ally? Because by going in, trying to do something, almost getting there, but not leaving behind stability, we show that we may not be as strong or committed a nation as we would like to think we are. Well, isn't there an option to not go in, but to support uh, education and uh, conditions that can allow a healthier uh, civil society or a stronger, empower civil society to build a healthier society, um, maybe at less cost than the military? Is that too kumbaya? Is that something that maybe after 20 years of uh, the so-called war on terror or the so-called forever wars, there could be a political appetite globally and, and domestically? Uh, what do you think, Ali? Um, first of all, I really agree fully with everything that Robin said and everything that also uh, Ambassador Jeffrey said. And I think we, we really need to move away from being idealistic in these kind of things, because the moment we started trying to do the right thing and only, you know, fund from far away, other regional players and international players who are operating in these countries are not going to be suddenly seeing the light and started operating also uh, with good faith. So this is, you know, it's always in the back of decision makers in Washington that, you know, the others will be taking advantage of what we're trying to do. But regardless of this, I believe that unfortunately in the last few decades, um, our values and our, um, our ideals as Americans, and this is something Robin mentioned, always seems to stop uh, with the conclusion of a specific mission. And that makes us look more, uh, you know, hypocritical in the world. Uh, if you talk to so many people in the Middle East, nobody believed that the Amer America will be there for them, even though we spend most probably the blood and treasure uh, in engaging in the Middle East. Uh, we've seen it, for example, with uh, our allies sometimes, you know, like uh, just to give an example, uh, it took us maybe a couple of minutes to betray Mohammed bin Naif in Saudi Arabia for the sake of a new guy. And then the same thing that happens in, you know, in Syria, where, you know, in a tweet, uh, we almost betrayed the PKK who spend, um, you know, more than 11,000, sacrificed more than 11,000 fighters and fighting ISIS and so forth. And we can go, go for a long time. But also at the same time, the more we get engaged with these conflicts, the more that we are becoming part of the problem or we are seen as part of the problem, not part of a solution, because immediately you're taking sides. And when you're taking sides of these conflicts, you're taking sides that's rooted in history, that's rooted in culture, that's rooted in conflict and ethnicity and sectarianism. So if you make one happy, you're gonna make the others upset and then you become the problem. We've seen that in Iraq, we've seen that in different places. And if you look at the conflicts today with the near power competition or the great power competition, there's a lot of similarities of conflicts and even the same fault lines almost before World War I in the 1800s, all the way from Crimea to Mosul. The struggle between Turkey and uh, Iran, uh, the Shia Sunni thing, the uh, Russians trying to have more influence uh, in, in the region and so forth. So we have to be very careful in our engagement to really lead with our values and we need to lead with our ideals, but we need to do it in, a such, in such a way that it's a national security imperative. It is not a, um, um, uh, a mean to justify an end. And, uh, and unfortunately, we're not doing that. And we haven't been doing that for a long period of time. So it's all fine and dandy for us to create, uh, to talk about human rights, to write countries uh, in the State Department report for torturing people and waterboarding people. And the same time we were doing the exact same thing. Um, it's it all talk, it's all fine and dandy to talk about uh, self-determination. And then sometimes we help dictators crush their own people or at least look the, uh, the, the, wrong, uh, the, uh, the other way. It's all fine and dandy for us to say, hey, we're there for you. And there is a, you know, and we draw red lines in the sand. And then if something happened, we move that red line in the sand a little bit back and we look the other way. Um, America is still, I think, the only superpower in the world, regardless of, I know that we're losing a lot of our, 
um, you know, prestige, if you want to call it. But militarily, we're still the strongest power in the world. And I think we need to, you know, lead with our values and lead with our ideals and send a strong message to all these young people who are asking for freedom, asking for liberty, trying to challenge a corrupt system, uh, not only in Lebanon, but in so many different places around the Middle East and around the world, frankly, that we will be there for them and we will support them in anything we can. And we will support them diplomatically with a lot of the institutions that exist. <laughs> we'll support them with PR and publicity. We'll support them with money and supporting these people on the ground to figure out self-determination for themselves is way cheaper than military engagements. Uh, Ambassador, do you want to take that that uh, thought a little farther? Yeah, yeah. Um, here's the problem with that. Um, we all hate corrupt systems and the new Biden administration is particularly enthusiastic about hating corrupt systems and lashes out verbally at them. Uh, uh, the problem is a corrupt system by definition is a system. It is a system of governance in state X. Um, we, if we decide not just rhetoric, but we're actually gonna do something about uh, getting rid of a corrupt or evil system. The best example is Gaddafi's Libya. Uh, we have to realize that something has to replace that system. If it is us, it's going to be very, very expensive and it gets to the endless war problem. If we decide we'll just do it and then wander away, Charlie Wilson's war last scene or, uh, uh, Libya by 2012, uh, you get uh, chaos heaped on chaos. Uh, let me give another example of the complexities in dealing with this, because I think um, it's important to realize there is no template, but then I always come up with some general templates, one of which is uh, we are judged by our consistency and our staying power. We're not, nothing makes me angrier than our saying, well, we're pivoting out of the Middle East. Folks, we got the over, and Robin was just out there with the commander of them, something in the order of 50,000 plus troops in the region. We've got 12 more or less partners where we have bases. We have $10 billion a year in grant military assistance and on and on. We're not going to build that all down, even if we wanted to. So therefore, it is absurd to tell people that we're going to be pivoting out, A, when we're not going to, and B, why should they do anything we want them to do for the uh, good of both of us uh, uh, if we're going to do that? Uh, the, the problem with, again, trying to deal with um, corruption and evil is that uh, we don't know how to replace it. The classic example is Assad, Syria. Uh, we started off deciding rather like Gaddafi, this guy has to go, he's terrible, let's support the opposition. Uh, then several things happened. First of all, a good part of the opposition, particularly the ones who fought best, were Islamic extremists. And among them emerged ISIS in uh, what was called at the time al-Nusra, who were tied to al-Qaeda, even worse. This led to Assad and his allies, particularly the Russians saying, hey, this guy is fighting terror. And in a half-hearted way, uh, the Russians and Assad were fighting terror, although they spent most of their time, as I said, barrel bombing uh, the opposition and the civilian population. But then it gets even more complicated. One reason, uh, and this is a senior administration official back before he became a senior administration official who said that at a conference once, uh, between uh, 2013 and 2014, there were 25 million Sunni Arabs between uh, Baghdad, ruled by a Shia Arab prime minister uh, with close ties to Iran, and Damascus, ruled by an Alawite heterogeneous uh, offshoot of Shia Islam, uh, uh, also closely allied with Iran. And these people felt oppressed and pressured, just like uh, 
uh, uh, Robin has mentioned today with the uh, PMU forces, the Shia militias in Sunni areas, there was something like that in Iraq and certainly something like that in uh, uh, Syria. And we didn't do anything about it, so they turned to terrorists. And for many of these people, the terrorists, and I've experienced that in Iraq, the terrorists in some Sunni areas are their salvation against people who come in and kill them simply because of their, uh, their sect. So uh, it gets very, very complicated. Uh, and today we have uh, states uh, in the region saying we've got to support Assad because he is the bulwark against terror. Uh, I don't think he's much of a bulwark. What I do know is that uh, he is one of the contributing factors to terrorism in Syria, just like uh, the government in Baghdad, at least up until recently, was a contributor to uh, the, uh, uh, the vehemence with which Sunni Arabs embraced uh, terrorist movements, uh, both ISIS and its uh, precursors. So I'll stop there. Would any of the panelists like to respond for uh, another five to eight minutes and uh, between you, and then we can go to audience questions? No. Nope. Well, we have plenty of great questions from the audience. Let's see. Um, I think uh, since you were just talking about the, the incredibly complicated dynamics in the region, um, we should just uh, keep going on and, and take it to another level of um, sort of stupefying complexity by uh, answering this question from, where is it? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Heinrich Kreft, uh, Director of the Center of Diplomacy at Andrasi University in uh, Budapest. Uh, to what extent is Turkey complicating the future of Syria and Iraq? Um, Ambassador, uh, you've seen this very up close. The, 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 you, you even mentioned some of the mistakes that were made in managing Turkey vis-a-vis uh, -vis the SDF effort. Um, what do we need out of Turkey as the United States, and what what does Turkey want, and and you know how how do how should the Biden administration navigate this thicket? Yeah, uh, Turkey is the um, poster child for complicated situations where there's no easy answers. First of all, uh, I think the Turks would say, and they hammered this into me every time I appeared, which was often in Ankara. Uh, look, uh, you're talking about an area right along our southern border which has been famously insecure for centuries. Uh, and we have critical security interests there. In Syria, the problem is the Turks have an abundance of security interests. Uh, they are in a major conflict with the Assad regime. <laughs> They're very concerned about Iranian and Russian influence there. As I said, uh, they have suffered uh, repeatedly from ISIS attacks. Um, in 2015 and 16 in particular. Uh, and they're very concerned about the PKK offshoot, the YPG PYD, which has morphed uh, with our help into what we call the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, and which is a, the Syrian branch essentially of the PKK. Uh, and trying to manage that is very difficult. Turkey is uh, supportive of the political solution to uh, the Syrian conflict. Uh, first of all, they want to get the three and a half million refugees from Syria that Turkey is hosting. That's roughly 15% uh, of the Syrian population back into Syria. They want to uh, eliminate these threats on their border. And uh, they want to <coughs> contain Iranian and Russian influence, all things that the United States is interested in. Thus, we've worked quite well with Turkey uh, in the Northwest, where it has significant forces and supports the Syrian opposition, who we supported in various ways for the last decade. Uh, the problem is at the same time, we have a very delicate relationship with Turkey in the Northeast. Uh, the Turks don't want us to abandon the Northeast to Assad and the Iranians and Russians. On the other hand, they don't want us to be partnered there with the Syrian democratic forces because of their ties to the PKK. This is an uh, uh, impossible situation to fix because we can't be there 
without having a local partner. As Robin said, it's only a handful of American troops. Uh, we need an effective partner on the ground. We have a very effective partner on the ground against uh, the SDF and frankly, in controlling the terrain. Uh, and we're not going to uh, give up that partner. So therefore we have, uh, again, this balance with Turkey that is very unhappy with the situation. It doesn't have an answer either. And so you just continue uh, constant talks. Occasionally we've had a breakdown. We've had one military incursion in 2019. We had to uh, go out and fix that. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very delicate and it just illustrates that uh, even with the best of intentions and our intentions were holy, we were going in to defeat ISIS, which certainly deserved to be defeated. <laughs> and we uh, inadvertently got deeper into the Syrian conflict and we got crosswise in the Northeast with Turkey. Uh, again, to the extent there's a solution to this, solution is very strong diplomatic oversight over all of our operations so that these other factors can be taken in. Uh, again, uh, there is no template, but now I'll throw out a bit of a template, which is uh, conflicts are not fought between military forces. They're fought between political entities for political ends. Uh, those ends are amoral, typically. They reflect national or ethnic or religious interests, and they need to be recognized and to the extent that they're not totally uh, lethal to us, uh, respected and taken into consideration. And that only can be done by diplomatic oversight over all of our operations, stabilization, military, intelligence, covert, you name it. Yeah, I mean, for, for anyone that has uh, trouble understandably following the, the alphabet soup of acronyms, what the ambassador is talking about is that the, the, the central player in the Americans' most reliable and most cost-effective ally in the entire uh, so-called war on terror uh, is the very organization or militias closely tied to the very organization that Turkey considers a terrorist organization and its biggest national security threat. So, so it's one of those incredible paradoxes. And I, and I think uh, your point is really well taken that, that you know, nothing can really be done about this paradox now that it's been established. And it takes really intensive diplomacy uh, to, to sort of on a minute by minute basis to, to keep things um, from blowing up. Um, and I think this is actually a good segue. And by the way, don't forget to, to keep submitting your questions to uh, MEP at wilsoncenter.org or tweet to at Wilson Center MEP. Um, I think this is a good, a good transition to a question that pretty much can be asked at any one of these panels, and it's always good to hear from such an experienced panel as this on this question. It's from Bruce Parrott, Professor of Russian and Eurasian Studies Emeritus at uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS. Um, to what degree uh, did past US policies and actions contribute to the rise of violent, violent extremism in the countries we're talking about? I think Robin touched very well on the Charlie Wilson's war example from Afghanistan. So maybe our panelists could talk about uh, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, and how, how did we contribute, how did the United States contribute to, to uh, the conditions that, that gave birth to, to, the, to the violent extremist groups that we're dealing with now, both in sort of mid 20th century history and in uh, recent uh, history for the past 20 years? And what are the implications for policies and actions in the future? And who do you want to take this? I think anyone who wants to jump in, just uh, you could do, you could, it could be a free for all now. <laughs> okay, I, I will spare everybody a lesson of history, Middle Eastern history, uh, but I'm gonna talk about really uh, the history after 9-11, if you wanna call that history. Uh, after Al Qaeda- Unfortunately it is, it's already 20 years of history. Uh, exactly, so please, exactly. that would be great. But for me, it's something that just happened yesterday, unfortunately, but, um, uh, you know, after 9-11, we swiftly acted against Al-Qaeda and against the regime that was protecting Al-Qaeda, uh, the Taliban regime. Uh, we dis dis disrupted their capabilities, their, their, their command and control. Um, and we got a lot of sympathies from around the world, even from adversaries, even from groups like Hezbollah and Hamas who put statements against the 9-11 attack and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, we lost 
lost that goodwill with the Iraq invasion in 2003. And after we went to Iraq, um, um, uh, we gave a new blood uh, for uh, jihadism, for Salafi jihadism, first with Zarqawi, and then with uh, the relationship that Zarqawi was built on Al with Al-Qaeda. And that created uh, a slippery slope uh, that affected so many different countries in the region, eventually gave a rise to ISIS, and we all know what happened over there. So yes, we are, we cannot say that we have nothing to do with what happened in the Middle East. Um, we have some responsibility of all these things uh, in sometimes, you know, uh, you know, throwing oil on already existing fires. And, uh, and I think um, we can say the same thing in Yemen. Um, you know, we needed to sign the Iran deal so bad that we allowed, you know, the policy of leading from behind and our regional allies to, to, to take over, um, you know, uh, uh, what they think is appropriate for their own national security and regional security. And uh, we allowed the war in Yemen, Al-Qaeda were about 500 members, 600 members before the Arab coalition war in Yemen. Now Al-Qaeda is about 8,000 members in Yemen. Uh, Libya, the same thing, um, you know, um, again, we wanted to lead from behind, the ambassador mentioned it a little bit, but then we allowed, you know, the NATO who basically didn't do anything and walked out immediately and then Libya became a conflict where the Emiratis, the Saudis, the Qataris, the, the, the Russians, the, uh, the French, the Italians, all of them are basically what we see in Lebanon, what we see in Syria. Every country has its own group and its own militia on the ground. The Russians even send um, um, their militias, you know, their whatever, the Wagner group, their non-state actors to participate directly in the conflict in Libya. So yes, um, we have supported dictatorships before that allowed these, uh, you know, uh, uh, that allowed these groups and terrorist groups to create a narrative for themselves. We uh, took sides in historical and sectarian conflicts that uh, backfired on us. Uh, the invasion of Iraq uh, was, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, had horrific um, uh, consequences. Um, and uh, some of our actions during that time period, uh, like torture, for example, uh, the Abu Ghraib, images of Abu Ghraib, as the Pentagon can tell you, and people from the Pentagon testified in Congress about that, were probably the number one rallying call for jihadis from around the world. Um, uh, all these uh, foreign fighters that came first through the jihadi pipeline to Iraq to support Zarqawi, people from Libya, people from Tunisia, uh, they were the stormtroopers for ISIS uh, later on after its engagement in Syria and Iraq. So, so in, in, yes, in, we, have a lot of, we, we have a lot to do with it, unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, Secretary um, Colin Powell reportedly told the White House before the war in Iraq, you, you, you break it, you own it. So we broke it, and guess what? We own it. So this is the, the litany of horrors of these uh, of all these mistakes. But but what? But can anyone draw out some lessons for how we should address the, 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 this current situation from from all these mistakes? I mean, it seems like a lot of different things have been tried. Is there anything left? I mean, one one thing I'm I'm hearing emerge from the panel maybe in common is the idea of having a very light military footprint and you know refraining from military. Uh, direct military involvement in 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 most cases, and and yet having an extremely intensive diplomatic involvement in in shaping uh, conflicts and and sort of reining in allies in certain situations, like we did not do in Yemen at the beginning. Uh, anything else that that actually is a lesson, a useful lesson, uh, other than don't do stupid stuff. And, and I can if, weigh in. And if I could actually, I want Robin to weigh in, but I want to pose her a question first to complicate her answer. And that is, uh, since I've been doing this in the 1970s and my one academic work of any significance was on the Korean War, mm -hmm. uh, every foreign policy problem we've had never has really involved, and that includes Vietnam and Iraq, us actually losing a military conflict. 
what I sense, and I've stayed as far away from it as I can in my professional career in Afghanistan is a situation where the other side is making military gains at a rate and a capability that means that unless they stop for some reason, they can militarily take over, if not all, much of the country after so much time, absent something dramatic. Uh, so thus, I turned to Robin, who was just out there with our military command, got the briefings. What is the military situation and how does that differ from other things? What are our options if we really are facing a potential military collapse? Well, you, you, you've asked two very different sets of questions. No. Uh, let me deal with Afghanistan first. The fact is that the uh, Taliban has been more aggressive. It has made physical military gains since October. Uh, and it is poised if the United States does not withdraw by the deadline on May 1st to turn on the United States again. It has been scrupulous in not attacking the United States. The nasty fighting has gone on between the Taliban and the government. That will change if we decide to stay and keep a small footprint until there's more tangible progress politically. But the one common denominator in all of these crises is that there is no military solution. And we think about, you know, we've killed, whether it's bin Laden, uh, of Al Qaeda or Baghdadi of ISIS and many others as having, you know, scored or, you know, strengthened our position. When in fact, um, that's in some ways the least accomplishment. We, it's important, but it's, it's not as important as finding the big, broad, diplomatic solution, but there's something in the middle that isn't being addressed in any of these conflicts. And that is, how do you take those who have been alienated? And I've spent a lot of time interviewing ISIS fighters, just like I did with Hezbollah and some of the earlier radicals in, um, in Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, and elsewhere. And uh, not all of them agree with necessarily with the ideology, but they do agree with the idea that someone's going to represent them, someone's going to empower them, someone's going to help them, whether it's uh, create an income or get a gun so they can protect their family and their neighborhood. And the big question really is how do we de-radicalize? How do we pull the rug out from underneath this phenomena that is a common thread across the region? And that's not military and that's not nation building. That's this big thing of how do you deal with this society? And at the US Institute of Peace, they're making a noble effort um, with very limited funds to try to broker reconciliation. But how do you get, you know, these, the, the rehabilitation of fighters, is it possible? Uh, you look at what we're facing in Syria, people have forgotten that there are something like 12,000 fighters who are still in prisons held by the Syrian Democratic Forces, that there are 75,000 women and children and old people in a separate camp, many of them deeply radicalized and being further radicalized because they're being held in the prison. And one of the real empty parts of policy is not this idea of building an alternative nation or winning militarily, but it's the population. How do you create hope, but how do you create an alternative? This, Ali knows this so very well. You know, what does it take to get these guys to see the light or to change their minds? How do you get society then to embrace them and to reconcile the forces that have fought locally each other? I went to a rehabilitation program two years ago um, that was run out just outside of Raqqa in Syria. And it was very impressive. And one of the reasons the Kurdish dominated SDF managed to bring in a lot of Arabs, their normal rivals into the SDF and get them to fight ISIS together was to promise them at the end that, that if they captured Arab ISIS fighters that they would put them through a reconciliation program and turn them back to the tribal elders to decide rather than put them in prison, unless they carried out, you know, gruesome murders and 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 major felonies, um, most of them are foot soldiers. And and the program was very impressive. In that, um, I, I saw one group of thirty-eight fighters uh, who had gone through this long program, and they went through a graduation ceremony, and the tribal elders all embraced them. 
And then I went to interview them. And the thing that was so moving was uh, one who said, I've been out of ISIS for nine months. I understand that it is evil, but I also understand that my life is empty now. I don't have a job. I can't support my family. And so there is so much on the social front. It's, it sounds namby-pamby, but this the whole idea of society, society, not just the military and not just the governments, society. And that's where we have so little uh, ac action. And, you know, we that's the only way we're going to solve this problem, this, this, you know, why are people attracted to these movements? I, I, I'm long winded, but the one last thing I will say is I've interviewed ISIS members in both uh, Iraq and Syria. And I came away thinking that these guys are not great ideologues. The, some of them are pretty ignorant. Um, when I ask one, you know, as the caliphate was falling, well, do you think there'll ever be a caliphate again? And he said, oh, yes, of course. Even Jesus said there will be a caliphate. And I pointed out to him that Jesus had lived 632 years before, you know, Muhammad and had never said anything, any such thing. And he ignored me completely. He said, no, no, even Abraham said that. So this is where you get into, you know, you need education, um, you need jobs, you need, and this is where it's not nation building, it's helping societies develop themselves. And this is not part of our counterterrorism efforts, not part of our aid. And we tend to give aid to countries in military terms. And one of the great dangers in Afghanistan to get back to where I started is that with the pullout of the US military forces that the US will also pull out its aid. And uh, Ashraf Ghani, the president of Afghanistan said on 60 Minutes a couple of years ago that his army would totally collapse within six months if it weren't for US financial aid. So it's kind of, you know, we everything is in inter interlocked, we're dealing with some of it, but not this huge real issue that defines the future of extremism. And, you know, just to take it even to, you know, more bird's eye philosophical level, what about the many people in, in all these societies who, who don't, who have never thought of supporting these terrorists? You know, I think uh, people are people everywhere and, and, and just, the normal people are, are have so many obstacles in front of them. Sometimes one of those obstacles can be misguided U.S. Uh, intervention, and sometimes it's something else. I mean, how can we remove the obstacles from these people, or at least not be part of them? This is a really interesting question. Um, let's stick with Afghanistan for a minute. Um, uh, there's several good questions about Afghanistan. I'll try to summarize them. Um, you know, I think what the, the, the real uh, urgent question we're facing right now is that, the, you know, the Biden administration has set a May 1st deadline or there is a May 1st deadline in Afghanistan. So what are they going to do? Are they staying for a while? They seem to, Biden seem to suggest that. Um, does that, wh what is what effect does that have on the peace negotiations um, if they stay? Uh, as well as um, the question of, of ISIS's own presence in Afghanistan. Are they also a threat? Is the Taliban the main threat, not ISIS? Um, and I think uh, the, this last interesting question can even be applied to Afghanistan. Uh, do we sometimes overestimate the impact of our assistance, whether it's military or civilian? Um, you know, are, are, are we, uh, are we um, having a negative impact on security in some ways with our assistance? Anyway, uh, the, uh, Afghanistan is a very urgent problem right now. What, it, what do you think the Biden administration is gonna do and what should they do? about these problems. And why don't you start, Robin, and if the others want to respond, feel free to jump in. So the deadline is May 1st, and the United States has promised that it will withdraw. It was a kind of arbitrary date agreed to just over a year ago. Uh, and it, it, the idea was to give time over um, you know, 15 months or so for the Afghan government and the Taliban to come up with a political formula that would allow some kind of sharing of power or some transition. So the, the Taliban had a political role. The problem is that the peace talks that started in September in Doha have gone absolutely no place. Both sides have been extremely stubborn. They've talked only about process, you know, which school of Islamic law is going to just, you know, be the framework for negotiations. And 
So uh, in a very blunt letter earlier this month, Secretary of State Tony Blinken wrote the president of Afghanistan and basically issued an ultimatum, you know, get a deal done. And so uh, we've seen now the U.S. also widen diplomacy so that it's brought in, ironically, Russia, China, Pakistan, India, Iran, and Turkey. There was a meeting on Thursday in Moscow where they brought the rival parties together and they issued a kind of very vague but lofty statement about we want to make peace. The, the next big step is this international conference in Istanbul in early April, which is supposed to come up with a final agreement. I mean, we're talking something that's three weeks before the U.S. withdrawal. And the idea of that happening after all this time is, you know, you have to hope, but will it produce something that is viable and most of all enduring? And you have to be skeptical about that. Joe Biden has wanted to withdraw from Afghanistan since 2010 when he was vice president. He said famously on Meet the Press uh, that the withdrawal would begin in 2011 and be totally out come hell or high water by 2014. Last year, he wrote an article in Foreign Affairs and said it's time for the end of forever wars. So he wants out, no question. The problem is, uh, do we, without a political solution, leave and leave behind what is an even bloodier mess and we look much like the Soviets did when it withdrew in 1989 with you know, little to show for it. Maybe a stronger CT force, but you know, for how long? And so it, one of the options facing Biden is to lengthen the deployment by weeks, months, maybe not put a finite date because the Taliban knows, well, all we have to do is sit it out until May 1st or whatever the next date is. But to say, look, uh, until you get a solution, this, this will be an unpopular choice. Um, America, as I said before, just doesn't wanna be there. But uh, you know, the, there are no good options for the politicians, no good options for the military. And if the US stays, then that basically voids or certainly undermines the agreement the US made with the Taliban to end this. And the Taliban will then turn on the Americans. Uh, and so, you know, I do not envy Joe Biden. Um, it's a really, it, it's an incredible conundrum. Anyone want to add something? Yeah, I mean, look, you know what? Uh, in uh, 1989, the Soviets pulled out of Afghanistan, um, as Robin mentioned. Um, and uh, later on, uh, the Taliban took over Kabul and Najibullah was hang up, hanged with his brother from a pole. Um, that is going to happen if we leave without guarantees and without a political solution. I mean, that's, you know, the, we, the, the agreement with the United States with that day, you know, in, in Doha, they had, as you know, negotiations, a negotiation between the United States and the Taliban reached out to an agreement. However, the second phase is a negotiation between the Afghanis themselves, especially between the Taliban and between the Afghan government. This is not going anywhere. Now the Russians are jumping into the bandwagon as part, I believe, of the near power competition with having that conference in Moscow, which basically a little bit better, uh, you know, uh, in dealing with the Afghani conflict, frankly, because it included India and included Pakistan, it included Iran, all powerful players in the Afghani theater. Um, and now we, we have that thing in, 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 in Turkey with also Turkey has its own reasons to be involved in Afghanistan, especially it's mostly Turkic people in Afghanistan anyway, ethnically. And that fits with Erdogan's regional policies. But I think what's going on now, if we don't have an, if, we, if the Taliban don't fulfill out the agreement, I think it will be frankly, and I probably I'm not gonna be popular in saying that, it will be irresponsible to pull out from Afghanistan. What about the relationship between the Taliban and Al Qaeda? This is why we won there in the first place. Just uh, a month ago, the UN Security Council put a report that the leadership of Al-Qaeda are still protected by the Taliban. We don't see any kind of moving away from their relationship with Al-Qaeda. We see still Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighting together against US troops and Afga against Afghan government in Afghanistan. So there are a lot of things that's included in the negotiation between the United States and the Taliban. Unfortunately, those things I don't believe are met 
and they are still a subject of negotiations. And I think we have to be very careful in remembering why we went to Afghanistan in the first place. You know, Ambassador Jeffrey mentioned something early on. When you talk about this engagement, you think we have like 100,000 troops over there. We have a few thousand sitting in bases and just supporting the Afghanis when they need support. I think this is a very good return of, 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 of security investments, if you want to call it. I think we need to wait until they have an internal diplomatic uh, political solution among the Afghanis, all the components of the Afghani government, uh, an agreement that regional powers support, similar to the type of agreement that they had in Lebanon um, in the 90s. And then we can uh, pull out with putting some security guarantees in place. But none of the agreements that we have with the Taliban have been met. Uh, there is no negotiation. There is no agreement with the Afghani government. There is still some talks, sometimes every now and then, about the prisoners issue. There is no agreement with the uh, with with the issue of you know, they didn't fulfill any of their agreements with the things uh, with with uh, disconnecting the relationship with with Al Qaeda. Uh, the Haqqani network still um, act, which is uh, you know considered uh, a terrorism group by State Department, still um, act. Um, in supporting Al Qaeda and the head of the Haqqani network is the number two in the Taliban. So we have to keep all these things in mind before we just make a, a make a move just for the sake of making a move. Uh, we have about eight more minutes. Um, did anyone want to comment further about uh, Afghanistan and the way forward? Um, and if not, um, I can, I, let, let me pause, anyone? Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's just, um, uh, let's take it back to uh, fi maybe final thoughts from, from, each, uh, from each panelist, if you wanna sum things up or if there's something particularly interesting that, that this discussion brought out for you. Um, I'll just mention a couple of remaining points from the audience that, that people are asking to, to be addressed in more detail. Um, we have Hiba Shesley from uh, uh, George Mason University asking, what about using the uh, National Endowment for Democracy to support civil society and independent media? These things are not expensive and they work. And we have another audience member saying, uh, does, uh, does Ambassador Jeffrey in particular mean from his comments that we shouldn't seek to address the drivers of violent extremism through foreign assistance, non-military? Um, and, uh, and then, um, I, you know, I think one thing that we haven't gotten to yet is, um, is are there specific ways that, um, you know, that, 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 Turkey and the, that we can balance the the security uh, needs of Turkey and and our needs in Syria because that that's obviously going to be uh, front and center for for upcoming issues for for the Biden administration. There were so many other great questions. We really appreciate that from the audience. Um, and uh, let's hand it to um, Ambassador Jeffrey to start the, uh, the 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 final thoughts, and we can go uh, then to Robin and then to Ali. Okay. Thank you. Um, First of all, on the uh, on the whole question of aid, uh, which picks up the National Endowment for Democracy, whether I think that there are programs that can deal with uh, violent extremism, uh, let me be clear. I spent every day of the last 20 years dealing with USAID and things like the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, it's very easy to spend an awful lot of money, like billions, and get very little out of it. Uh, but with the right programs done the right way with buy-in by people on the ground and with clever accounting and all sorts of tricks that we know how to do, there are many things you can do with aid programs. You can uh, diminish the appeal of violent extremism by counter programs, frankly, propaganda, we call it information operations. I've seen that work. There are things you can do in Iraq. You can keep a central bank functioning very effectively. You can ensure that bread is baked for 30 million people every morning. You can conduct an election with a relatively high degree of uh, uh, integrity. Uh, these are all, however, tactical things. They're important. They, at incremental levels, increase 
our success rate and undercut the appeal and the actions of our adversaries. What they do not do, and I have to keep coming back to this, is they're not going to change these basic societies. If these societies are corrupt, if these societies cannot produce a future for the young people, if they're very, very bad on creating jobs, we're talking about huge, huge problems inside countries that an outside force, even with the hundreds of billions we threw into these things in both Iraq and in Afghanistan, are not able to fundamentally change. You can do it at the margins. And once again, at the margins can be good enough to defeat a force that's also trying, be it ISIS or be it Shia militias in Iran, to work at the margins too. They don't have an alternative answer. Only after many years, and Robin has seen this in Lebanon, it's the only case I know, where a outside force by building on its local partners has been able to fundamentally change a country. But that's rare. Most of the time, people at best I'm saying that ironically, just turn it into chaos, which they may want, but it's not a very good solution for the people in the country. So we have to be very uh, humble on what we can do. Once we're humble, then there are things you can do, and those will have certain effects in changing the dynamic on the ground in ways that can be helpful. But you cannot fix, I mean, look at our own country, look at how we engage in this every day. And I'm now getting away from the subject, but I just saw this on the issue of the border and the problems we have right now. And that we immediately grab, we've got to transform Central America into California so that people won't want to leave Central America and go to California. So we got a solution. Hey, let's, let's you, know, you know, grab our rucks and get going. I'm sorry, this doesn't work. I think that was sort of a perfect uh, ending, actually. Um, we should certainly look at our own country and think about the, the symbiosis uh, among all these problems in the world. And that, that's a great place to end. Um, uh, maybe, Marissa, would, would, would sum things up for us? Uh, do you, are you waiting for final thoughts from Robin and Ali first, though? Uh, yes, I, it, actually, if we have time, uh, I, uh, then just a, a one or two sentences from each of you would be fantastic. I just wasn't sure about our, our need to wrap up at the exact dot of noon. If, if we have like two more minutes, then could each of you give us uh, two or three sentences in conclusion? Thank you. Robin, you're on mute. You're on mute, sorry. Robin, you're still on mute. Once again, uh, I will try to be uh, very brief uh, and say the danger is that in trying to create solutions, we create even bigger problems. Um, I would dispute some of uh, Jim's uh, allegations about Lebanon, but that's a conversation we can have off, uh, off screen. I, I think one of the great dangers also is that we sometimes see when we go in to try to create big big programs, big military um, uh, agendas to, do, to counter terrorism or defeat local extremist groups, that we end up looking like we're trying to colonize a country. And that's a real danger uh, everywhere we are, not just in the Middle East. And now to Ali. Um, thank you, Robin. Um, just I want to say something probably, you know, Robin touched upon earlier in her comment. Look, we have thousands and thousands of people in detention facilities in Syria. Um, ISIS did not go away. Uh, those individuals um, can be a future threat. It's a generational threat. The conditions that allowed ISIS to exist, that allowed Al Qaeda to exist, it exists, continue to exist today, uh, not only in one country now, but in multiple countries in the Middle East. Terrorism didn't go away just because we're not reporting about it in the United States. Uh, you know, these things are not happening. It, it's not not happening in places like a Sahel or in Mozambique, or actually it's happening in areas that it never happened before. Let me remind uh, everyone how we had ISIS. Before ISIS took over Mosul, they did an operation called breaking down the walls, taking advantage of the absence of US troops in Iraq. 
they got all their leaders and their fighters out of Iraqi jails. And then they had what they need in order to do what we all saw, right? This can happen again if we don't support the PKK, if we don't have a solution for all the thousands of people in Al-Hawl and other detention facilities, if countries don't start standing up and taking their people and prosecuting their people, the State Department um, under the former administration and under this administration, they are continuing to engage with our foreign partners, in, especially the Europeans, in order to take their citizens to back to their countries, either for prosecution or rehabilitation. I know that there are so many complicated legal issues associated with this, but if we don't deal with the problems that exist today, these problems gonna consider, they're gonna, they have the potential to create um, a fault line down the road, uh, to create um, a threat down the road. So these threats that we dealt with in the last 20 years did not go away. You can make the argument that these guys are refocused now, they are rebuilding their networks, so they are in more countries than they are, and, and there's a possibility that they come back. Um, so we need to be very careful and keep our eyes on the ball. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I think, uh, you know, at the very least, we, we sharpened our understanding of the many paradoxes <laughs> in the situation. And I think uh, it can feel frustrating, but it is also impossible to solve a problem if you won't look at it squarely. So thanks so much for your efforts to do that. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Marissa for a farewell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, thank you, Ambassador Jeffrey, Robin Wright, um, and Ali Sufan for a truly enriching discussion, as Anne mentioned. Um, and thanks to you, Anne, for uh, doing a great job uh, navigating us all throughout this discussion. We look forward to more uh, panel discussions on this um, topic, particularly as we mark uh, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 this fall. Um, and lastly, I wanted to bring people's attention to the next MEP uh, panel discussion that will focus on Yemen as we mark the sixth year into the Saudi-led intervention this week. The event um, is uh, on uh, Women of the Revolution, a vision for post-war Yemen. It's on March, uh, March 31st, so please tune in and thank you again for joining um, MEP events. Thank you.